All right. Well, hello and welcome everyone to the next event of the Global Biodiversity Festival. My name is Joe Grabowski and I'll be your host uh, for this segment. For those tuning in, don't forget to get on Twitter, get on Instagram, hashtag uh, back or Global BioFest. Um, so we know you're tuning in. We can interact and, and share the day together as well. In between events, if you can slip outside, slip out into your neighborhood, grab a few screenshots uh, of biodiversity in your neighborhood and share them on Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag Backyard Bio. We'd love to get a nice global snapshot of what everybody has in their backyards. All right, as we move along with the Global BioFest, I'm so excited to be introducing Asha DeVos. She is a Sri Lankan a marine biologist, ocean educator, and pioneer of blue whale research within the Northern Indian Ocean. She's established her own nonprofit, Ocean Swell, uh, as Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education organization. It's the home to the well-known Sri Lankan blue whale project, the first long-term study of blue whales in the region. She's a National Geographic explorer, uh, TED fellow. Asha, it's so great to have you joining us live from Sri Lanka today. We're so excited to get to know you and your project a little better. All right, I'm excited to share with everybody out there. So first of all, thanks for having me at this amazing event. It's such a great lineup of speakers. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Welcome you. Um, oops, I, am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay, um, so I'm super excited to have you here with me in Sri Lanka. This is quite unique that I can have all of you here, um, also in my home where I am speaking to you from. Um, I'm going to talk about three giants that we have in Sri Lanka and tell you a few secrets about them. Uh, you might be surprised to hear that we are home to the largest baleen whale, which is the blue whale. It's also the largest animal that's ever roamed the planet the largest tooth whale or the sperm whale and the largest terrestrial mammal which is the elephant um we as a, a, a as people in this country we're not that giant but we definitely uh, outdo ourselves when it comes to the giants in our in our natural environment and i'm gonna take this opportunity to um, to compare and contrast these three different species and show you how the most unexpected are similar and the ones you think were similar are not so let's dive in. Let's go out to sea first. Uh, but before we start, I do want to make sure we are in this. You all bought your flights to the right country, to the right place. That's Sri Lanka. That's there, right in the heart of the Indian Ocean. It is a beautiful tropical island, surrounded by eight times more ocean area than land area. So now that you guys have all landed, let's get a boat and let's get out to sea. Um, to start off with, I mentioned in the title that I'm going to talk about the largest baleen whale and the largest. Uh, tooth whale in our ocean. So let's do a quick marine mammal 101 just so everyone's on the same page. What's a baleen whale? What's a tooth whale? Well, whales and dolphins can be divided into two main groups um, that they are based on how they feed. So baleen whales will typically have comb like structures in their mouths, to, uh, with which they will filter feed through the water column. And those comb like structures are made out of the same things as your nails, so keratin. And that's called baleen, which is why they're called baleen whales. So you think about blue whales, humpback whales, they all have that feature right? And on the flip side, you have the toothed whales, which as the name uh, states, they all have teeth. So you think about dolphins or killer whales or sperm whales, they have teeth and that makes them toothed whales. There's another characteristic difference and that's why I've got this uh, image up on the screen. You'll see this is actually a baleen whale. This is a blue whale and they have two nostrils. So if you look carefully, you can see two holes on the back, on the front of the photograph. Those are its nostrils. It's kind of like a nose that's shifted to the top of its head. Whereas um, tooth whales always have just one nostril or blowhole. This is important for us to know because that helps us to distinguish between these groups. Now that you all know that, let's get out to sea and check out some of the cool differences between the blue whales and the sperm whales. So to start off, here is a blue whale. And how do I know that? Because of the gigantic, powerful glow that rises vertically to about 12 feet. It is immense to witness. I can tell you that from personal experience. And um, I've spent many years of my life studying blue whales, as Joe mentioned, uh, but my career actually started with sperm whales, which is why I've tried to interlace them in, and they are now part of our project. So here you can see a blue whale's blow is tall, vertical, very powerful. On the other hand, this is a sperm whale. So we're looking at it going across us, and you can see it's a low bushy blow that seems to be slanted off. And the reason for that is because while 
sperm whales, like all toothed whales, will have one blowhole. Its blowhole is located on the left-hand side of its head. So when it exhales, that exhalation goes off, slanted off to the left-hand side. So it's not very tall. It's off to the left-hand side, which I think is quite cool because that means we can identify these species when we're out at sea using these characteristics. Uh, apart from that, if you look at the shape of the tail fluke, this is a blue whale tail fluke. You can see quite triangular, pretty lean. And this is a sperm whale tail fluke, really kind of rounded, really totally different. Uh, the one thing they have in common, which you'll notice, is they have these nicks and cuts along the edges, which are really useful for science because that allows us to identify individuals and know who's coming to visit us um, from time to time. Blue whales tend to be quite solitary. Uh, they, you will generally see them on their own unless they're aggregating to feed in a place. Um, and that's because they have these really uh, loud vocal calls that can transmit through the ocean over vast distances. So they don't need to be hanging out right next to their friend to be able to talk to them. Um, I do have a recording of a, a blue whale call on this, which I don't think you'll be able to hear because it's very low frequency, but if you listen carefully. You have to listen carefully. Basically, it's like the low rumble of a jet engine. And, you know, to me, when I listen to it with my headphones on, it feels, uh, I, I can feel it in my chest. Okay. So it's very kind of a, it's a sound that really transmits. It's very, very low frequency. So we can't actually just hear it if we drop an underwater microphone in the water. We have to actually speed it up to be able to hear it in our own hearing range. Sperm whales, on the other hand, way more social. I mean, they are like dolphins, so they have like great social lives. They tend to hang out, especially in these parts of the water, uh, oceans. These are the tropical areas. Um, you'll see matrilineal groups. So you'll see mothers with um, their daughters and, and their you know, aunts. And so it's usually tight family groups, all related females kind of hanging out together. This is a photograph taken in Sri Lanka, just so you know. There's probably about 28 sperm whales in this image. It's a unique photograph pretty stunning really. And uh, you can see they're very close together. They kind of tend to be um, very tactile and uh, they don't mind bumping into each other. Funny shaped heads, really strange looking animals, but still beautiful. Um, and this is what they sound like. So that clicking sound is very characteristic of a sperm whale, right? So it's so very, very different. I mean, if you couldn't hear the blue whale call, just so you know, it's just a very low rumble, kind of very, very, like very powerful, but like a jet engine, whereas sperm whale calls are much more click, click, click oriented. Um, but funnily enough, sperm whales actually are the loudest animals on our planet based on uh, the decibel of, uh, at, at which they communicate versus blue whales. And we always think blue whales are the loudest, but they're actually not. So that's a little fun fact that I want to throw in. Okay? Blue whales have grown to this immense size, the largest that have ever roamed our planet by feeding on some of the smallest things in our oceans. So if you Google what do blue whales eat, it'll tell you krill. Here in Sri Lanka, we've done research to show that they actually feed on a kind of shrimp, tiny, tiny shrimp. That is a normal human sized finger. I do not want you to assume that's a giant's hand. And if you think about that in relation to the little, little creature on top of it, which is what the blue whales feed on, it's pretty small. So how do they grow that huge? Well. They're really smart. They have evolved to feed on swarming species. So these tiny species are never hanging out in the water column on their own. They hang out in these swamps. So all these speckles that you're seeing on the screen right now are actually millions of individual little shrimp in the water column. The advantage is these little shrimp, they don't swim away when the blue whale starts to approach. So the blue whale doesn't have to waste energy trying to chase after it. It just basically opens its mouth really wide and takes a gulp and it can ingest a lot of calories at once. Sperm whales, on the other hand, I'm sure you've heard the myths and legends of them, you know, wrestling these giant squid, squid underwater. I mean, I don't know um, what exactly happens, and I can tell you, I would love to be the person to watch this wrestling match that happens at the depths of our oceans. And, you know, sperm whales do tend to follow their food very deep. They can go down to about 1,000, 1,500 meters, whereas um, blue whales, their food is a lot high in the water column, so they'll go to a maximum about 300 meters, right? So you can see there's differences in where they're going to feed as well. And um, what they feed then comes out the other side. 
Uh, this is a picture of blue whale poop. It's beautiful. It's bright red in color. I talk about it all the time, but I do want to in, you know, infect more people with the excitement around what I think is the most beautiful animal poop in the whole world. Okay. If you have, if you have, uh, if you want to argue with me, that's fine, but you have to give me a specimen of whatever else is more beautiful. Um, so they, it's red in color because they feed on these shrimp-like creatures and we have skeletons on the insides of our bodies, but shrimp wear their skeletons on the outside. They have exoskeletons and these exoskeletons have pigments which are red and so when they come out the other side, that's what you see. Whereas sperm whales on the other hand, which you can see at the bottom right, their poop is more browny, greeny, blacky in color because they feed on squid. Uh, squid ink, ink comes out the other side and that's kind of what you see. So very different. There, here are some close-ups of what we do with this poo. One thing is you can see the blue whale poo is very heavily digested. So for us to understand what these blue whales are feeding on, to look at the prey, we have to actually extract the DNA of the digested prey from this sample, which I've collected with a tea strainer, simple as that, and um, to look at what exactly they're feeding on. And that's how we know they're feeding on shrimp and not krill as blue whales and red whales in the world. If you pay close attention, you might see these black strands in the poo. And what I want to tell you is that this is another fun fact. Those strands are actually pieces of baleen that have come through the gut. Um, it can function as a way to get rid of parasites from their body. Um, what's cool is that baleen will change color and length depending on the species of baleen whales. So blue whales will have baleen that's pure black and it can be about one foot in length. They always only have baleen on the top uh, uh, jaw. Uh, whereas um, the, uh, there are bowhead whales that live in sort of around the Arctic that have the longest baleen. It can be 10 feet long and it's more ivory color and very bristly. So quite characteristically different. Um, and then you'll see in the other picture, I'm holding a jar and these two things, black things inside, those are squid beaks. So while the sperm whales will feast on squid, they can't digest all the parts of the squid and the beaks don't get digested. So when they poop, what they leave at the surface is my gold. I pick up these squid beaks because they can help me identify what species of squid these sperm whales are feeding on. So that's really quite cool. The one thing they both have in common, both kinds of poo is that they make me very happy. So you can see this is me joyously collecting samples of both blue whale poop and squid poo um, for, for research, obviously, obviously. So now I'm gonna, now I've shown you how, you know, blue whales and sperm whales, even though they both live in the same environment, the marine environment, they tend to be quite different from one another, right? Like, and that's, I think is fairly obvious now. But I want to now take you one foot into the terrestrial environment on land and one foot in the water, right? So we're going to compare sperm whales and elephants. And all this time you may have been wondering, how do elephants fit in? And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you. So sperm whales, as you can see in this photograph, that lumpy bit in the front is actually its nose. Sperm whales have um, the largest sound producing organ of all animals and that nose is used for sound production and if you think about an elephant it's got a pretty big nose as well their noses are used for things like picking things up and more tactile functions uh, sperm whales and uh, elephants have something else in common they both have the largest brains in the water and on land and that allows them to have quite complex social structures and behaviors and so we'll just talk a little bit about that as well um, these are some of the elephants that we see here in Sri Lanka. You can see there's a, it's a, a group, um, female, um, uh, sorry, elephants tend to hang out in these matrilineal groups. So again, like the sperm whales, you'll have related females hanging out together with their young. Um, they tend to use a lot of tactile cues to keep each other together. They touch, they caress, they rub. It's very, very normal for them. And they also use ultrasonic, uh, sorry, infrasonic sound, low frequency sound to communicate with each other to keep their groups together. So their uh, communication can travel about four kilometers. Um, sperm whales also use tactile, they, they're very tactile. So in their groups, you can see here, they're kind of rubbing. They tend to rub their flippers, their bodies, their jaws against each other. So they also are quite tactile in their matrilineal groups. And they also have communication calls called 
codas, which are very specifically related to communicating with each other, that they, and to keep their groups together and probably reprimand their babies, um, that can travel about eight kilometers in the water. So quite lo long distances. Um, but it's important if you want to keep your little co unit cohesive and close together and make sure that you're not losing each other. And if that's really important to the survival or your social organization, you need to be able to communicate over these kinds of distances. Um, with um, elephants, as well as with sperm whales, you'll often see um, um, older individuals. So after about 40 years of age, their reproductive rate will decrease. But that doesn't mean the females, then the older females get kicked out. They're really valuable. They're repositories of knowledge that they then just share and pass on through the generations. So there's this sense of culture in these two species uh, because of this sort of social learning that happens. And um, you'll see also that young will, they will suckle on the females that are not their mothers in both species, which is super interesting. It might just be for comfort reasons. We're not entirely sure, but that's kind of interesting. It's like wet nursing in humans. Uh, we also see the behavior of babysitting where you have, um, uh, you know, like, for example, if an uh, elephant calf um, uh, kind of gets tired while they're trekking through the jungle, it'll tend to maybe sit down, kind of take a rest, but they will all, the whole group will then stop and wait for the baby to kind of recover and rest and stuff like that. And so they, they really don't leave anyone behind, which is something that I guess we can all learn from. And also with sperm whales, it's the same thing. You'll see a cycling behavior that happens because if you think about it, adult sperm whales can dive quite deep and female, and sorry, the babies can't. So they'll do a shallower dive and they'll come up. Um, to the surface, but there's always another adult that will be at the surface to look out for the calves. So you see babysitting in sort of both these um, matrilineal situations as well, which I think is so fascinating. Um, we also see that they um, tend to be, um, they, so with, when we think about elephants and we think about whales in general, they're what we call keystone species. They're very important to the environment that they live in um, and they play a very integral role. So with elephants, if you think about it, they tend to, you know, basically um, because they, they'll eat um, plants and trees and fruits and then they'll spread seeds around. That's really important for the environment. They might, you know, crack down some trees, allow room for grasslands. So that's kind of an important function for that ecosystem, right? And it allows other species to grow and thrive. And similarly, whales are also very important. We, they call, we call them ecosystem engineers. Um, their poop, for example, is the fertilizer of our oceans. And that's what allows the tiny little phytoplankton or microscopic plants to grow and proliferate. And as they photosynthesize, they release oxygen into the environment. So again, both of these have that, both. Um, not just sperm whales, though whales in general and elephants have that in common as well. And then if we think about the males, I've talked all about the female matrilineal groups for both these species, the sperm whales and elephants, but with the males, what we see is the males will mature and after a certain age, they will go off and hang out in bachelor groups. So they're called roving males. They'll go off with elephants. They'll go off and hang out in bachelor groups or alone uh, with sperm whales. They'll go off to cooler waters where feeding conditions can be better. They might occasionally hang out with other males, but otherwise they don't. And when they come back to the breeding grounds and when they're looking for females, they both have a specific call that's uh, like an advertisement call, right? So um, the sperm whales will have what we call a series of very loud clangs, a clang sound that we think is for advertising to females and being like, hey ladies, I'm back. I'm totally ready if you need to, if you want to mate. And with elephants, it's the same thing. They have what we call must rumbles. And these must rumbles are also um, their advertisement call. So when they come back, they're like, I'm back. You know, I'm ready. I'm in must. I'm super ready to mate. And you know, that's what that's what that communication call is. So I hope you can see these interesting kind of similarities in these species that you probably at the start of the uh, talk, if you weren't familiar, I would guess that most people would think that the two marine species are similar and then the marine versus terrestrial are quite different. But I wanted to flip that on its head and show you that that's actually not the case in that in terms of their structural organizations and stuff. These two species are so much more alike than a sperm whale and a blue whale, which I think is fascinating. 
So the one thing I want to basically end with is to say, you know, these are incredible creatures. We live in an amazingly biodiverse planet. Um, we have the privilege, I would say, to experience these animals in their wild and natural environments. Um, and I want to remind all of you that when we go to see these animals in their wild spaces, we're actually going to visit them in their homes, right? Um, and so oftentimes what we do is, it, it's just imagine like it's Sunday and you're having ice cream with your family and you're having a great time, you're having a laugh, you know, you're sharing your ice cream. And then a stranger comes into your house, crashing through the front door without any like, you know, knocking on the door or anything unannounced, making really loud noise, throwing garbage everywhere, sort of crashing around, coming, standing too close you get really scared and you start to get really stressed. And that is kind of how we tend to be. We are that uninvited guest in many of these habitats and spaces and environments. And I want to say, as I close this talk, I just want to remind you that if we want to be respected in our homes, then we really have to learn to respect these animals in theirs. Thank you very much. All right. Awesome, Asha, thanks for that amazing presentation, comparing those terrestrial and marine species and really showing people the most beautiful poo on the planet. So we definitely appreciate uh, you being able to do that for us today. Uh, if I can get you, Asha, to stop the screen share, if you just click at the yeah. top and we'll get you a nice and full screen for a little Q&A before we wrap up today. Sweet. Perfect. You're back, we got gotcha. you. Okay, I can't see myself, but yeah. Okay, okay. trust that you're here. Cool, uh, good stuff. So. All right, let's start off. Easy question. Um, you know, you're, you're the first person to study uh, marine mammals, get your PhD in Sri Lanka. What drew you to the ocean? What drew you to the water? Wow. Okay, so in a nutshell, my story is really long. I grew up inspired by National Geographic magazines, um, wanting to go where no one else would ever go and see what no one else would ever see and um, just wanting to explore the world. And I wanted to be an adventurous scientist. That's how it started. Then I fell in love with water. I didn't grow up going on beach vacations. That's really important. But I grew up in a household where curiosity and learning was very much encouraged. So we had pets that were like caterpillars and scorpions, basically. Uh, a big influence on my life was, um, I used to go to my local swimming club and Sir Arthur C. Clarke used to come to my swimming club. And for those of you who don't know who he is, he wrote the 2001 Space Odyssey. He's one of the fathers of satellite technology. And he moved to Sri Lanka to dive the shipwrecks. And he used to tell me all these stories that basically left me hanging. And so I think there was a, a culmination, a whole lot of things that came together. But by the time I was 18, I was like, I'm going to be a marine biologist. And do you know what? When I told people that, they were like, what are you going to do? Because in Sri Lanka, it wasn't a, a, a career path. It wasn't a job, even though we're a beautiful tropical island. But I did have the support of my parents who said, do what you love and you'll do it well, which meant I worked really hard to make sure that it's now a, a field in this country. Marine conservation is something that we talk about regularly and just to show, the, to show people what an incredible world we live in. All right. Awesome. So this population seems to be a resident population, whereas you see bigger migrations with other species of blue whales. That was an amazing, you know, kind of first discovery that you had as you started seeing this population. So what, you know, over the last few years, has anything developed around more protection for this population? That's a really great question. So fundamentally, the work that I've been working on for about eight years, I mean, all our research um, in my organization, we, we say we do marine conservation research. So every bit of research feeds into conservation. And so with us, the primary question we've been asking for a very long time, the problem we've tried to resolve is that these large blue whales, as much as we think they're the largest on the planet, the one thing that's bigger and that can kill them is man-made and that's container ships. And we are on the path of one of the busiest shipping highways in the world, everything from Singapore to Dubai cruises through here. So mortality, you know, it's, it's obvious, it happens. And so that's been sort of one of the big things where we've done a lot of science around showing um, how we can separate where the whales and where the ships are so we can avoid this kind of collision interaction space. Um, and we've been working at the policy level, really trying to drive government to understand the value of protecting these species also, uh, because they are basically um, the main species that people come to see when they go whale watching in Sri Lanka. So, so we do have to 
to protect them. Um, I think I have definitely seen a culture, cultural change from most people in this country not knowing we had whales to today people having an appreciation and more people talking about their uh, protection and the need for it. And I, I think that to me is hugely positive. All right. That's amazing. Great story. Uh, Asha, we're going to squeeze one more question here because I think it's a good one. I'm hoping we've got lots of young explorers, scientists, adventurers, conservationists tuning in today. What's one piece of advice that you would leave with them with today? So I would say um, no challenge is uh, too big. Okay, so there's no challenge in this world that you can't climb over or walk around. And you know what? Don't let them stand the way. They're going to come. And I can tell you the, the challenges are what make life much more interesting. I mean, to be fair, like if my story was, I woke up in the morning, I went to school, I finished school, I went, did marine biology, I became a marine biologist. Joe wouldn't want me here to talk to you because my story would be so bland and so unexciting. And what makes my story interesting is all the challenges I went through, everything that I've had to learn, all the hurdles I've jumped over to be where I am today. And that's helped me. Actually, the challenges have pushed me to become the best version of myself. And so you should always, always unfailingly aim to be the best version of yourself and take on those challenges. Be grateful for those challenges, embrace them and push right through. All right. I love it. Perfect advice. Before we sign off, Asha, I just want to talk to the viewers quickly. Uh, just a reminder, uh, hashtag Global BioFest uh, post. Tell us what you're enjoying. Ask us some questions. We'll be there live and interacting. We're also trying to raise uh, some money uh, over the course of this weekend. So on the website, you can make a donation. Uh, it's one of the six conservation groups that we are working with, with a goal of 10,000. And we will make some more donations if we do exceed that goal to some other conservation groups. Uh, that have joined us today. So take a minute, swing by the website. We're going to pause the live stream for just a moment now. So good time for a stretch, quick bathroom break, refresh on our homepage for the next event starting in five minutes. And we will see everybody shortly. Asha, thank you so much for joining us today. As always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.